such a big pleasure to be with you this evening. Good evening, I'm Joroge Mwaura. Welcome to KTN Prime. And I take you straight to our Studio B, where James Smart is standing by to give us a quick preview of his program, Livewire, this evening. James Smart. Well, Joroge, there are many things we could discuss this week, but just after just that massive election, it's important to just take stock of just what happened. I will have a panel of lawyers and will just be walking through in this election what happened before the election, what happened during this election and after the election, auditing the election, if you like, on KTN Livewire. That will be coming up immediately after you're done, Joroge. Thank you so much, James Smart. That's uh, taking stock of the recently ended general election. Let's go to the details now of our bulletin tonight. The International Criminal Court Prosecutor Fatou Bensouda has said that the withdrawal of charges against former head of civil service, Francis Mudaura, has no legal impact on the case against President-elect Uhuru Kenyatta. The move is a major setback to Horu's defense team who are hoping to get the case referred back to pretrial following the collapse of his core accused former head of the civil service, Francis Mudaura. Now this is likely to be the new battlefront between the two parties since Uhuru's team has insisted that his case cannot stand without that of Mudaura. In a new application dated Wednesday 13th, Ben Suda said that according to the Rome Statute, the legal status of one alleged indirect co-perpetrator has no bearing whatsoever on the guilt or innocence of another alleged co-perpetrator. Now the Coalition for Reforms and Democracy Court will file its uh, presidential election petition at the Supreme Court tomorrow. Lawyers representing Cord said they are not interested in any sideshows, adding that theirs is a legitimate legal process to ensure the will of the people in the just concluded election is respected. But as Patrick Amemo reports, the Cord coalition has cautioned their rivals in the Jubilee Alliance to strictly observe the transition provisions on the assumption of office following a dispute in the presidential poll. Coalition says it's ready to file its petition Friday, but it's also citing frustration from IBC on surrender of very vital document to help the case. Code's legal team said it was in the final stages of preparing its presidential election petition, but were quick to observe they had encountered obstacles and frustrations from the electoral body despite the court order. We will file tomorrow. It is important for Kenyans to note that in spite of our high court order issued yesterday, to provide us with the relevant documentation, the IEBC, for some strange reason, continues to frustrate the directive. In addition, on Monday, we alerted Kenyans to the fact that the IEBC had summoned returning officers to inverted commas, correct inverted commas, some entries in order to conceal the anomalies. A short text message from IEBC sent to media houses Thursday evening states the over 33,000 form 34 requested by code and used to tally presidential results are now posted on the IEBC website. With regard to form 35, which carries results of other candidates, IEBC says those forms are only available at constituency polling centers. So, so far as we speak today, uh, I think in terms of form 34, 35 and 36, uh, I would say that only about 10% has been made available. Controversy and confusion surrounding the final voter register will be another source of the epicotrum battle between CODE and IEBC. Some of the final registers, the figures there are more, mm -hmm. far much more than the original final register. If you have been looking at the, um, uh, at the website of IEBC, over the period of uh, since uh, 18th of December to date, there have been various versions of that register up to the 4th of March. The court legal team says it has secured witness affidavits, facts and grounds to sustain their petition. They have an obligation if they are making an alteration, at the very least, to call the political parties or to call their representatives and explain. On the transitional plans, court cautioned Jubilee to remember that there was no vacuum in the office of the president and that the grand coalition government is still in charge until a new president is sworn in. And the position is very, very clear. The president begins working after taking the oath of office. So I think we Kenyans and whoever is in government now should be a bit careful in how he handles 
this transition period. Elsewhere, commenting on the dispute, more than 20 newly elected leaders from Kisi and Nyamira counties, as well as lower eastern region, have supported Code's move to petition the presidential election results. It's regret regrettable that the conduct of the election by IABC has not been satisfactory to all the parties leading to what we now see, the court action by the court coalition. It will be unfair for a section of members of parliament who participated in an action and lost democratically to claim that the entire community has therefore shifted from, uh, from the court and gone to any other side. And as the court team heads to court, the National Civil Society Congress has called for an immediate end to all public rallies until the presidential petition yet to be filed by code is heard and determined. Patrick Amimo, KTN. Let's cross across to the city center studio where we find our guest for tonight is none other than Eric Motoa, LSK chairman. We are very, very happy you could spare time to come to us despite the rain. Good evening, Eric. Good evening to you. Now, let's uh, look at it uh, this way. What are your observations about the whole timing? So many people are reading so much into this, uh, into this petition. They're wondering whether it was in good faith or just an afterthought. What can you say? Well, uh, for me, uh, first we need to understand that uh, it is within the rights of uh, the court coalition to proceed and petition the Supreme Court if they are not satisfied with the results. The question to ask is whether or not they have a formidable or strong case to convince the Supreme Court that uh, these elections, the presidential elections, ought to be nullified. Now, you cannot answer that question until and unless you've interrogated uh, the evidence which they allege to have so that you can be able to point out and say, in my opinion, this does not seem to be adequate evidence to uh, get uh, a decision nullifying the elections. So that is probably what I can see at the moment. It is their right indeed, uh, but some politicians seem to be capitalizing on this already, you know, for all the bad reasons, I should say, and most of their remarks, according to so many people, border on arrogance, if not hate speech. Is this lawful when we know this is a legal process and not a political process, Eric? I agree with what you have said. Your sentiments are correct. Um, once you've chosen the legal means of resolving a dispute, then you should desist and you should cease from making any political statements to convince other people other than the Supreme Court judges that you have a strong case. When you, 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 you make those kind of um, statements, then basically what you're saying is that um, uh, you do not respect the court process. If they don't respect the court process, what should be done to these politicians? Because obviously they are fanning emotion. They are not strictly following the law. Can anything be done so that this process is left to the judiciary and not really uh, left to the politicians as it were? Remember, we still have a law against hate speech. The Musalendo Kibuja's uh, committee or commission should be able to look at what statements have been made and still use that law to arrest and prosecute persons who are making those kind of allegations. Let's talk about uh, the assumption of the office, uh, Eric. Yes. Uh, as you heard in our news, President-elect and his deputy believe that the judicial process and their work can run parallel as long as, long as they do not um, you know, overstep their mandate. What does the law stipulate uh, with regard to the president-elect, especially when faced with an election petition uh, such as the one that's being filed tomorrow? That is right. Um, there are things that the president-elect cannot do at this time, and there are things that the president-elect can do at this time according to the assumption of the Office of the President Act. Uh, for instance, the law allows the president-elect to in consultation with uh, the committee on the assumption of office of the president to ask for certain in, uh, information from public officers. For instance, the act allows uh, the president-elect to get briefings from security chiefs, 
uh, on matters related to security of the, the country. The law also allows the president-elect to uh, engage other institutions for purposes of uh, making preparations for his assumption of office, but not for purposes of, for instance, uh, acting as head of state. He can, for instance, meet uh, uh, diplomats if it is for purpose of preparation for the assumption of office. However, he cannot meet the head, or the, he cannot meet the diplomats as head of state. That one he cannot do. He cannot, likewise, he cannot sit and chair mm -hmm. the National Security Council as the chairperson, but he can get briefing from the chiefs, the security chiefs in the country. Mr. Chairman, can you tell viewers uh, what would happen if the court uh, petition indeed succeeded? We wouldn't go for a runoff. We would actually go for a rerun. Am I right? Yes, we'll do fresh presidential elections. It's not a runoff. We'll go back and do elections as if we never conducted any presidential elections. Would that involve the other, you know, uh, presidents, uh, presidential candidates, all of them? Yes, the other presidential candidates will still run, but uh, is not mandatory. If one wants to opt out, there's still uh, an option to do it, but uh, there's nothing which bars the other presidential candidates from being in the ballot box. Eric Mutua, we thank you so much for your time on KTN Prime. See you another time. Thank you. President-elect Uhuru Kenyatta and his deputy William Ruto will continue preparations to assume office despite the impending court petition seeking to overturn their election. Uhuru and Ruto said that they are already under pressure to deliver on their campaign promises and every minute counts in their quest to transform the country. And as some Ogina reports, they do believe that the judicial process and their work can run parallel as long as they do not overstep their mandate. The Jubilee Alliance was meeting women leaders as it embarked on its quest to transform the country, which it says is unstoppable even by the impending judicial process by their rival called coalition. President-elect Uhuru Kenyatta and his deputy William Ruto stated that they have sprung into action to begin actualizing their plan and pledges made on the campaign trail. A move they say should not be construed as denying code the democratic right of petitioning the election. We had a plan as a Jubilee Coalition and we are not going to waste one single moment that God has given us actually because we are waiting for a ruler. The judicial process proceeds, the Jubilee government continues to prepare to govern this nation. When we spoke during the campaign trail, Kenyans were listening. And already, we are under pressure. Hmm? Kenyans, I, I remember I sent an SMS that was sent to my phone to His Excellency, the President-elect. A Kenyan was saying uh, their daughter, who is in Standard 1, is already asking when she is coming to pick the <laughs> laptop computer. Code has been quite critical about the president-elect and his deputy enjoying trappings of power despite an impending petition seeking to annul their election. However, Uhuru says the focus now is to unite and transform the country. Uh, consistently, and maybe some of our friends are, are not understanding where we are coming from. We're not, when we reach out, saying so because we have any fear of any kind. When we are reaching out, we are reaching out because we understand that for this country to move forward, we need to heal it, we need to reconcile it. We are going to use every minute available to begin to work on our plan so that we can deliver and take this country to the next level. Uhuru and Ruto have been transacting semi-official business in the transitional period including several diplomatic courtesy calls and receiving briefs on state security. And today's meeting was their third official engagement since assuming the position of president and deputy president-elect. To the women in attendance, they pledged that the Jubilee government will strive to attain the elusive one-third gender parity rule to see increased women participation in government. Mr. President, I do pray and I believe you because when you assured me and you signed, you know, your left hand, Kimoto, 
you signed and you assured that you are going to ensure that women of Kenya will not have to walk long distances to fetch water. My government will seek to further increase representation of women in all decision making through appointments to leadership positions. The Jubilee Alliance boasted of having at least 75% of women elected into parliament drawn from the alliance. Out of the 16 elected women, 12 are from the Jubilee Alliance. As the president-elect saying that they will deliver on the promises they made pertaining to women and the youth. Under the leadership of Uru Kenyatta, the Jubilee Coalition is willing, we are prepared to work with our brothers and sisters who we went to competition with. Samogina, KGN. And staying with the same vexed uh, question of assumption of office, the government has defended the move by state security organs to give President-elect Uhuru Kenyatta security briefings, saying it is anchored in law. A government spokesman, Mubui Kariuki, says Section 10 of the Assumption of Office of the President Act stipulates that the President-elect shall receive security briefings from the respective national security organs. <coughs> He says the act also allows the president-elect to request for such information in writing from a public officer, public officers who fail to comply with the provisions of the act, commit an offense and are liable of conviction to a fine not exceeding one million shillings or an imprisonment for a term not exceeding two years or both. Several political leaders have in the recent past criticized the move to give President-elect Uhuru Kenyatta security briefings, arguing that it is illegal. Now, whoever will enter State House as Kenya's fourth president may not be known until the petition to be filed by court tomorrow is heard and determined, but the other legislative business will have to continue as it is now, the IEBC may gazette the names of the new legislators and what will follow will be the convening of the House of Representatives by the incumbent president. And as Aaron O'Shea reports, the senators will move into a temporary home as the Senate chambers are not yet ready. If at all the Supreme Court will find merit in the case that court coalition will file challenging the election of President-elect Uhuru Kenyatta, then the current president will convene parliament and the Senate as the electoral body ponders the next move. This will also mean that parliament, both the Senate and the National Assembly, will continue with the business as the executive arm will remain as it is now pending the outcome of the case. As it is now, President Kibaki is awaiting gazettement of the MPs and senators elects before he convenes both houses. According to the Constitution, once the IEBC gazettes the final list of members of parliament and senators elect, then the president is expected to issue a gazette notice to convene the House. This should happen within 30 days after election. And as preparations continue for the 11th parliament's convention, KICC will temporarily house the Senate as the old chambers of parliament where they will be permanently housed is under renovation. The Senate and the National Assembly can only have joint sessions on special occasions, for example, during the State of the National Address by the President. TNA and ODM will each get five slots of nominations to the Senate, with URP getting four and WIPA two slots. This is in accordance to the formula provided in the Constitution and Elections Act, where parties share slots using their parliamentary strength following a general election. ODM managed 78 elected MPs, with TNA emerging second with 74. URP has 60 MPs, while WIPA has 19. ODM and TNA will each get four nomination slots, while URP will get three, with WIPA slated to get one, totaling to 12 nominated MPs. Aaron Ocheng, KTN Prime. High Court Judge Justice Mobi Ngugi has directed former Embakasi parliamentarian Ferdinand Waitito to serve the IEBC in an election petition where he's challenging the election of Dr. Evans Kidero as governor of Nairobi. 
Waititu, who moved to court under a certificate of urgency, wants the court to stop the gazettement by the IEBC of Governor-elect Ivan Skidero until his petition is heard and determined. Presenting his case through lawyer Harrison Kenyanjui, Waititu wants IEBC compelled to give records of polling stations of Westlands, Ruaraka, Langata, Kibra, Embakasi and Madare constituencies where he claims that illegal votes were cast from non-existent votes. Waititu wants the election for Nairobi County declared invalid, saying the results were announced before final tallying. But it also claims that Form 36 was not signed by the county returning officer as required by law. Dr. Kidero cleaned the seat after polling 692,483 votes against Ferdinand Waititu of TNA, who polled 617,839 votes. Jim Nambaru of APK came third with a poultry 52,084 votes. 25 magistrates will continue serving in the judiciary after the judges and magistrates vetting board gave their career a clean bill of health. However, three magistrates were found unfit to continue serving on the bench. Sophia Wanuna reports on the ongoing judiciary vetting process that has now moved from the judges to the magistrates. The Judges and Magistrates Vetting Board has today cleared 25 judges and magistrates to continue serving on the bench. However, three magistrates were declared unfit. Narok Law Court's Chief Magistrate Wilkinson Nyaga Njagi was found unfit to continue serving on the bench after the board found that he had imposed a wrong sentence on an accused person. He had learned about his error shortly after he had delivered his judgment, but had not taken any steps to rectify the mistake, nor had he taken any corrective action after he had learned that the wrongful sentence had not been rectified on appeal. The accused in that case is still in prison. Wilkinson Nyaga was also faulted for sitting in a matter where he had commercial dealings with the accused. The board finds the conduct of the judge in the handling of this matter totally unprofessional, unbecoming and folly far below par. The image of the judiciary has been tainted by such conduct. Walter Ndolonyamira, a chief magistrate at Bungoma Law Court, was also found unfit. The board said that while ruling on a case of defilement of a minor, the magistrate used a technicality to hand the accused a lighter sentence. The axe also fell on Busia Law Court's chief magistrate Margaret Getonga Rinturi as the board found her unsuitable to serve in the judiciary. The magistrate, by written communication, advised the board that she had voluntarily decided not to appear for the scheduled hearing and requested that her name be scrapped from the schedule. Despite her refusal to appear before the board, it relied on a questionnaire, wealth declaration, complaints and response to complaints among other documents as a guide in its decision making. <laughs> the Sharad Rao led board also announced that their work had been slowed down as two positions in the board meant to be occupied by foreign judges were still vacant, awaiting approval by the National Assembly. The board has so far vetted 39 magistrates. Sophia Wanuna, KTN. In other news on KTN Prime this evening, one person died while another was rescued when part of a building under construction along school lane in Westlands caved in. The two were working on a foundation for the extension of a building that is under construction when the incident occurred. The injured man was rushed to nearby hospital for treatment and later discharged. Wilkul Stanyabwa reports. Shortly after 8 o'clock on Thursday morning, construction workers at this building reported an accident. Three workers had been digging... The foundation for the extension of the building. While two climbed down into the trench to dig up the dirt, a third cleared away the soil. The mound of soil they had dug would however cave in, burying two workers beneath it. 
kuna hizi trapa zenye ziligongelewa kwa hiyo kwa, kwa ukuta kwa wall hivi kwa hiyo wall kaa bado tunaendelea kuchimba ndio nikasikia hiyo wall imeweza kuanguka na ikafunika wawili wenzangu wenye tulikuwa nao hapo ndani The worker who had been ferrying away buckets of soil dug up by his colleagues managed to get away before the soil caved in. Rescue workers and police officers banded together to rescue two others who were trapped in the hole that they had been digging. 21-year-old Jacob Mbidi was one of the two men trapped beneath the soil in the gaping hole in the ground. Sijui ni jiu ilitoka huku juu kwanza. Ikaanguka chini. Ilipoanguka chini. Ilipoanguka chini nikamuuliza akaniambia nika mtu amepitia juu akanyanga mchanga ikarudi kukaaka ukuta moja ya saidi ikaanguka ika eh ilipomomoka ya, mimi nikakimbia nikaenda kulalea ile kona iko saidi ile his coworkers would struggle for hours to get him out akatoa mchanga akatoa mchanga akajaribu kunifuta lakini wapi kakuta haiwezekani kaleta hii pipe ya maji akakuja wakaweka hapo akaweka hapo mchanga ikawa matope matope hivi nikakuta mimi sasa naweza distribute tv this was the first job that the form four lever had held since he left school last year he had worked here for just two months While Mbidi was rushed to the hospital for treatment, the workers made efforts to reach his friend, a 25-year-old construction worker still trapped, his fate unknown. The rescue operation has been ongoing. It was uh, uh, hampered by the, the, the morning showers uh, in the morning. Shortly after 3 o'clock Thursday afternoon, rescue workers found the missing worker's body. The body was removed to city mortuary and police have launched investigations into the circumstances surrounding his death. Wilkinson Nyabwa KTN Prime. Now, about two years and six months ago, Kenyans celebrated the promulgation of the new constitution in a milestone that was meant to usher in a new dawn. Ten days ago, on the 4th of March 2013, Kenyans went to the polls for the first time under the new constitution and for the first time the country's president was elected through a truly representative vote. And the constitution provided for avenues to settle election disputes and it is therefore commendable to see aggrieved parties trooping to the court to challenge results as opposed to taking to the streets in protest. Now this is a fundamental right that cannot be overemphasized. The petition challenging the presidential vote is yet to be filed. In fact, it will be filed tomorrow. But whether it will be successful or not, it needs to be given its time in court and the outcome at the end of it respected. Now, this will be a true test for the reformed judiciary and our democracy. And as the president-elect awaits his swearing in, the Constitution, once again, is also very clear on what he can or cannot do in that capacity. Now, we all know that the incumbent will stay in charge until the president-elect is sworn in. However, it must be remembered that the Constitution serves the interests of all Kenyans, and whatever he says with regard to transition and devolution should be respected and adhered to as we enter the uncharted and complex territory of a decentralized government. And that is the notebook for this week. In KTM Prime and just ahead, news making headlines in the county. Stay with us. This is KTM Prime.
County for our next story. Police in Mombasa have arrested 38 people in an early morning raid on the notorious Mwembe Tayari market in connection with petty crimes and suspected substance abuse. The 38 were nabbed at the neglected market building which street families, muggers and peddlers have since made it home. Our senior coast reporter Ferdinand Omondi reports. Apologies for that uh, lack of the story that I just introduced. Let's go to the next one. The District Commissioner of Madera West District in Yeri County, Abdullahi Galgalo, has begun closing down bars in that area as the clampdown on excessive drinking in central Kenya is stepped up. In Gando location alone, seven bars have been shut down in a move that has elicited mixed reactions from those who support him as well as those who oppose the action. Katian's Karon Derry has that interesting story. The alcohol problem in central Kenya is rife and has been at the core of many socio-economic problems in the region. Stunted growth due to men abandoning their responsibilities and insecurity stemming from illegal activities aimed at generating income to fund the habit. And it is for this reason that the District Commissioner Madera West in Nyeri County, Abdullahi Galgalo, is clamping down on the drinking. In Gandu location of Madera West, bars outnumber any other amenities. And here, seven bars have been closed down by Galgalo, a move he says he has no apologies for, despite complaints from those who love their drink. While addressing a public baraza at Kiamariga area, Galgalo said he regrets that central Kenya has become the laughing stock due to men abdicating their marital and work responsibilities and instead letting their women take over. This is one of the seven bars closed here in Gandu location in Madera West, Nyeri County. A move that the provincial administration says will increase productivity, sobriety and development. Nasikia ukikosana na kina mama huko uh, mahali ambapo si central province, nasikia wanawambia mabwana zao, I will Nyeri nice you. Unajua mana ya Nyeri nice? Mana yake ni kuwa itakutwanga kama vile mabibi ya nyeri wanavyotwanga mabwana zao hiyo ndio sifa ambayo tunataka tuwe nayo members of the Madera West district liquor licensing court urged the residents to adhere to the laws stipulated in the alcohol drinks control act 2010 referred to as the Motudo laws tulikuwa tunatetea ile tunaita tunaita girl child siku hizi tuko na shida ile inaitwa boy child ningewauliza kama mama nimewaza watu wone huruma vile tunaumia wengine tunagoja kaju ya watoto wetu kuona wasimami vizuri tugeoba tu watusikie na at least wapuguze pombe principals of ngandu boys and girls primary schools uploaded the move saying whenever parents are required to attend school to discuss their children's performance a majority of those who would show up would be their mothers and the few men who attend would turn up drunk when we invite them for meetings and they come attend the meetings drunk we actually lack ones. The parent will be moved out of this this bar somewhere you need to some anyhow in the on the lawn and the parent the children would peep through the bar, through the the window and on the fences and you would find them imitating this type of darkness in school. But not everyone is happy with the district commissioner. What we to Manaka Bada Akazi I don't see I I know us. But Galgalo says he's not relenting and hopes that other leaders will follow suit and implement the law in central Kenya before matters get out of hand. Karen Derry KTN, Enyari County. Certainly a very positive uh, move there. I don't know what you have to say about it, but uh, I do think that alcoholism never built a county. Anyway, man-eaters are on the loose, uh, this time in uh, Nandi and Uasin Gishu counties. It's a sad story, this one. The 
uh, panic has gripped residents of Nandi and Wasingishu counties following a recent incident where a body of a man was discovered with most of his body parts missing. Residents believe that the man was a victim of an attack by a wild animal and have resorted to hunt it down. And as KTN's Masikandi reports, even though they are yet to come face to face with the suspected man-eater, they are not giving up. During the day, everyone here puts up a brave face. They have to, because when dusk falls, it is a different story. The reason being the fact that a body was discovered in Kosirai area in Nandi about two weeks ago with some parts devoured by what locals fear could be a wild animal. The fears prompting these men to wake up early morning with one cause, finding the animal that they say was ported last night. <laughs> The Kenya Wildlife Service has, however, dispelled fears of a man eating animal on the loose, urging local residents to go about their daily chores without fear. They, however, say their officers will help in the search to dispel fears. Sasa ndiyo tunawafia watoto wakati wanaenda shule. Tunayasafikiria wenda hii nyama ikashambulia watoto. Ndiyo tunataka serikali weangalia. The men in Seyo village have been on this search for two days now and so far they have not been able to trace the alleged wild animal. Many now close business early to head home before darkness sets in for fear of the unknown. Nandi County KWS say circulation of the reports of a wild creature in the social media had aggravated panic in Nandi County and parts of Warang areas in Wasingishu after a picture of the alleged victim did rounds on social media, adding that leopards do exist in Nandi North and South Forest, Kimondi, Tinderet and Bonjoge Game Reserve, but they do not come out of the areas. Masi Kandia Katian, Eldoret, Wasingishu County. most industries by one shilling and 17 cents while kerosene preferred by most rural and semi-urban households was adjusted by two shillings and 60 cents now as a result uh, motorists in Nairobi will now buy a litre of petrol at 117 shillings and 69 cents and diesel will retail at 107 shillings and 37 cents while kerosene uh, will retail at 8 88 shillings and 54 cents within the city and its environs. Now, if we look at the other parts of uh, the country that is in the major towns, petrol will retail at 114 shillings and 43 cents a litre in Mombasa. In Kisumu, the same will sell at 119 and 43 cents, while in Eldoret, a litre of petrol will go for 137 cents. According to the Commission, the prices are in response to a rise in the cost of crude oil internationally. However, this is expected to impact on the cost of living locally and the prices will no doubt have a significant impact on the rate of inflation which has been on the rise in the last two months. Now, moving on to more business, Kenya's raw sugar production is forecast to rise 5% to 520,000 tons in 2013, helped by good weather and a bigger supply of cane that matured late last season, data from the industry regulator showed. And Kenya has an annual sugar deficit of around 200,000 tons, which is usually filled by imports from other producers in the region. Kenya Sugar Board, according to Reuters News Agency, says the country produced 495,000 tons of sugar in 2012, down from a revised output of 501,000 tons the previous year. The regulator said the 2012 deep was mainly due to a cane shortage, especially in the Mumias and South Nyanza zones in the West. Kenya has an installed factory crushing capacity of 30,109 tons of cane per day, and the country plans to privatize 
five sugar factories to reduce inefficiency before the ending of trade safeguards in March 2014 that limit imports from the common market for East and Southern Africa, also known as the Comiso Trade Block. Now, a day after the Kenya Revenue Authority raised alarm on traders' failure to issue ETR receipts to customers, I sought to find out if this indeed is what's happening. And let's take a look at what the outcome was. While Kenya Revenue Authority is experiencing a shortfall in tax collection to meet its target, there's a growing concern that Kenyans are partly responsible for this. A day spent with some traders in Nairobi indicated that some goods and service consumers do not demand for receipts while the service providers issue money or receipts. When they come buy stuff, some want receipts, they are in a hurry, some don't want. So mostly for record purposes, I'd rather give receipts. While KRA is penalizing traders for not issuing electronic tax register receipts, the traders argue they issue handwritten receipts which are also inspected by KRA officials. Preferably an ETI will be better, but so far receipts. It's not so bad. I always uh, insist on a receipt because you have to keep my own records as well and it for, for them as well there should be a receipt. But nevertheless if there is not one there available then I just sometimes just pay and walk out. Uh, but uh, I think it's very important that we do everything officially and keep a record of it. According to the authority, supplying goods and services without ETR receipts is contrary to the VAT Act. Some traders have complied to the VAT Act and ETR regulations nonetheless. Despite issuance of handwritten receipts to customers, the traders KTN spoke to insisted on paying their dues twice a year. So could it be that some KRA officials conspire with tax evaders and don't report tax offenders? And that's the question only KRA can be able to answer. Now let's move on to more business news. Insurance and asset management firm Britam has swung back to profitability following a 2.8 billion shilling pre-tax profit it posted for the year ended December 31, 2012. The firm, which has also diversified to property development, recorded the impressive revenues from sale of its insurance policies as well as investment income. Philip Keitani has the details. Britam while announcing its return to profitability, the firm noted that it had ripped from its investment portfolios as well as growth in its sales of insurance portfolios. The income managing director Benson Moiregi noted that he had seen the group's investment rise by 5 billion shillings in the period under review from a loss of 2.1 billion shillings in the previous year. Gross revenue from its insurance and asset management arms grew by nearly a quarter to 7.2 billion shillings. In this market for the last 48 years, these 48 years have been years of continuous growth, continuous years of evolved, involvement. The business has evolved from a small home service insurance company. Projecting a better run in 2013, Britam is planning to raise its product distribution network in Kenya through increased human capacity and investment in ICT. Regionally, the asset managers already have presence in Uganda and Southern Sudan, with Rwanda being on its radar. We see ourselves as unique and very attractive to investors if we can execute our strategy as we envisage and intend to do, and as our results will show as we continue. Elsewhere, Diamond Trust Bank posted a 39.9% jump in its pre-tax profit for 2012 to 6.03 billion shillings, driven by a rise in interest income. The bank, in a statement to the Securities Exchange, noted that robust economic activities in the country had helped it boost its lending and earnings despite high interest rates. On its part, Standard Chartered Bank of Kenya posted a 40% jump in its pre-tax profits for 2012 to 11.6 billion shillings, also attributed to a rise in interest income, said net interest. Income rose 41% to 14.2 billion shillings, while loans and advances increased 17% to 112.7 billion shillings. Philip Keitan, KTN Business Today. 
And well, let's take a look at how the Kenya shilling is faring against the international currencies. We'll also have a look at the stock market. And that's it from us here at the business desk. Do care to join us tomorrow sometime.